Today, I'll be giving a very rough introduction to one of the building blocks of modern theoretical particle physics, the H theory. I'll start with its humble origin from the field of classical electrodynamics and try to show how this quote unquote redundant description of electromagnetism flew into the language with which physicists think about the fundamental nature of the universe. First, some clarification on location. I will be using lowercase c and lambda to denote scalar fields, that is, functions that offer just one number for each input of space and time. I'll be using both capital letters to denote 3D vector or 3 vector fields, which give 3 numbers for each point in spacetime, corresponding to their x, y, and z components. For compactness and flexibility in extending to higher dimensions, I'll be writing partial derivatives with this shorthand. The gradient operator in this notation will thus be a 3 vector of partial x, partial y, and partial z. So far, these should all be familiar topics in multivariable calculus. Once we want to incorporate special relativity into our theory, however, we will have to, in a sense, weave space and time together. 4D vector, or 4 vector fields, will have 4 components, 1 in time and 3 in space. To distinguish them from 3D vectors, they are not bolded, and instead will be tagged with Greek letters such as mu, nu, rho, and sigma in the subscript or superscript position. Do not confuse them with exponents. There are no exponents in this video. We can feel ge we can general we can also generalize the gradient operator as such to include a partial derivative with respect to time in its time component. In relativistic physics, we also have a special kind of a 4x4 matrix, which is, in a sense, a product of two 4D vectors. They are called tensors and also have time and space components. Like vector fields, they may have different values for different points in spacetime. This strange notation is part of tensor calculus. This very strange notation is part of tensor calculus, a very powerful mathematical framework for describing relativity and field theory. With that out of the way, let's get started with the physics. To recap, these are Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics, also known as F drop the constant. We have rho as the electric charge density and J as the vector electric current density. These equations look fairly complicated, not just visually, but in the sense that with both the electric and magnetic vector fields having three components, our description of the electromagnetic field has six apparent degrees of freedom. This is not very satisfying. A core goal in physics is to find a simple, elegant model to describe the natural world. We want less variables and less equations. Luckily, it turns out we can leverage some vector calculus identities to do just that. Recall that the curl of the gradient of any scalar field and the divergence of the curl of any three vector field are both always zero. In fact, the formal identity is commonly used in classical mechanics as well as electrostatics to define a scalar potential energy field P. In central force problems like two-body orbits, this likes to simplify from three degrees of freedom down to one. In electrodynamics, however, we no longer have any curl-free field. What we do have is a divergence-free magnetic field. This lets us define the magnetic field as a curl of a vector potential field A. Even better, with this definition, we're able to have the electric field as a sum of its scalar potential and the time derivative of this new vector potential. As you can see, we have now reduced Maxwell's equation down into two, and eliminated two degrees of freedom from the electric field. But this potential-based formulation of electrodynamics is more than just simpler. It in fact provides a bridge from classical electrodynamics into Einstein's theory of special relativity. Whereas the classical two-field description of electrodynamics is not formulated for relativistic physics, when we combine the scalar potential and the three-vector potential into a single four-vector potential, this new field turns out to have just the right behavior for the intermixing of space and time. And we can still recover the classical description by defining an electromagnetic field tensor as the difference between two permutations of the space-time derivative of the scalar potential. thus recovering the electric field in the time row and column, and the magnetic field in the space row and column. Then, taking the space-time derivative again, and sending that to be equal to the charge density scalar in the time component, and the current density 3 vector in the spatial component, which combined is also known as a current 4 vector, we are able to recover the first two of Maxwell's equations. But what about the other two? 
It turns out that in the mathematics of space-time, every field has what is known as a Hodge dual, defined such that the dimension of a field and its Hodge dual sum up to 4. The Hodge dual of the scalar potential is the 3 vector potential and vice versa. If we take the space-time derivative of the Hodge dual of the electromagnetic field tensor, we can recover the latter two of Maxwell's equation. As you can see, by encoding the electric and magnetic fields in the 4 vector electromagnetic potential, we are able to formulate a description of electrodynamics which is both simpler and more extensible in special relativity. You might be wondering, can we simplify this even further, or is this the least degree of freedom that we can constrain our universe? Well, yes and no. Recall that even with a single scalar potential energy field, there is no absolute zero that we can measure. Whether a ball rolls down a hill does not depend on how high the field is, only its steepness. We can add an arbitrary global offset to the single field, and no laws of physics would change. In fancier terms, the laws of physics are invariant under a transformation of the gauge, or a way we measure the potential. Going back to the non-relativistic case for a moment, with two potential energy fields, one scalar, one a 3D vector, we have even more freedom with arbitrary offsets. As you can see, should we offset the vector potential by the gradient of an arbitrary scalar field lambda, and the scalar potential by the time derivative of lambda, Maxwell's equations still hold. Critically, our arbitrary call offsets no longer need to be the same everywhere, but can instead be local. Maxwell's equations are invariant under certain local transformations of the gauge. In the language of relativity, the gauge invariance is generalized further to a transformation given by a 4 vector field omega. But though the four potential seems even more under constraint, it turns out there is not really a way to elegantly eliminate its degrees of freedom. In fact, doing so would, in a sense, defeat the purpose of having such a potential in the first place. As we've just seen, the four potential is able to generalize electrodynamics for relativity, but it can actually do much more. The quantization of this four vector field can tell us how its practice of energy behaves, giving rise to the quantum field theory formulation of photons and electrons. And with just another generalization, it can describe the behavior of other quantum fields and particles as well. This is what's known as Young Mills theory. In a nutshell, Young Mills theory generalizes the four vector potential field and its behavior in two ways. First, each component of the four vector can now be a number or a four vector or a four by four tensor, corresponding to the electromagnetic, weak, and strong fields respectively. Second, it introduces a commutating term to the definition of the field tensor, which vanishes if the components of the potential field commute. One of the more immediate implications of this generalization is the self-interactions of the gluons, in contrast to the non-interaction of photons. Because each component of the strong potential field is now essentially a matrix, young mills theory is able to explain why, while the photons can only scatter off of each other with the help of other particles, gluons can scatter with themselves, because their matrices do not commute. So in summary, these are a few examples of where the semi-redundant nature of the four potential, in other words, gauge invariance, can explain the heart of modern physics. I am just learning these concepts myself, so apologies if I made any mistakes. I think I probably made a few. Uh, this video is uh, a project that will help me learn as well as uh, hopefully interest you guys in field theory. Thank you for listening.